I worked at a church plant at East Petersburg. Um, it was called Real Life. So if anybody knows where the like, Lancaster area is, um, it's kind of like you go to Lancaster and then you take this off-road and it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Erin kind of knows where that's been because she's been there, I think, before. And so it's kind of a little like you pull up and you're like, am I actually going to church? Yes, you are. Um, this church wasn't anywhere close to what we have today. I mean, we are very blessed and very fortunate to be able to walk into a building like this. Um, at Real Life, we kind of walked in. It was, imagine, like, pews in a smaller room, like, red and brown. That was about it. We had a stage. It was nowhere as cool as this, but it was what we had. Um, and before coming to the part of the team at Real Life, I was coming out of a very, like, toxic church relationship, um, a very toxic, also romantic relationship. And so I felt burned by the church, and I didn't really want to be around people that much either. I wasn't the uh, extroverted self that I am here today. I was very like, people will get them away from me. Um, I don't want to talk to you. Um, but I was also very upset with the Lord. Um, if I'm being honest with myself, I took the position at Real Life to prove to God how wrong he was. That he was wrong about me, that he was wrong about people, he was wrong about everything around me. Um, and yeah, it was a pretty rough season, if you can tell. Um, and yet, through the people at Real Life, God had other plans. These people didn't have much. The majority of them came from immense trauma, abuse, and drug addictions. But, and they were also burnt by previous church leaders. Um, yet, they surrounded me with such love and encouragement. You're probably wondering, Gavin, this is really depressing. Where are we going from this? Hold on, give me a minute. They helped me to come back to the Lord, come back to the church, come back to the people. Their depth and authenticity to love because God loved them was a catalyst for my own faith and honestly for the rest of my life. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those people. And that might be like a big statement, but as you're thinking and as we're working through this message, think about some of the people that if they weren't in your life, where would you be? It could be brothers, it could be family members, it could be sisters. I mean, those are the same thing, but as friends, they can be also considered brothers and sisters. I mean, Donovan is a brother of mine, and we are not related. Aaron is a sister of mine, and we are not related. Austin is a brother of mine, and we are not related. And yet, we considered each other at that level. So imagine those kind of people, completely gone. Nobody in your, like, they're not here. Imagine where you would be today. And it was because of them that God was able to move me to the position that I am here today. It was an important season in my life, and I'm very thankful for it. The people at Real Life were a catalyst for my faith, um, the relationships that I'm in, and the people that I'm surrounded by. Uh, for Real Life, it really kind of set the tone. I mean, it made me come to terms with who I am, and helped me to propose to my amazing fiance, which is awesome. But the people at Real Life really set that trajectory. And honestly, if it wasn't for them and God working hand in hand, it, again, wouldn't be here. And so today, we're going to talk about the importance of having and identifying these catalytic people in our lives, the catalysts of our faith. So how can we identify who our biggest catalysts are? Look around you. These people are usually the people that we look up to the most, spend the most time learning from, and spend the most time with. So if you're like sitting next to your homies, these are the greatest examples of the biggest catalysts of our lives. If you're sitting there and you're like, I really don't have anybody next to me, well, think about maybe some of your family members. If this is your first time here, we would love to connect you to a small group. we got some amazing leaders here that can help you out and through that process. But these people influence us in big ways, even when we aren't aware of it, which is why it's so important to pay close attention to those people who are in our lives. You can't avoid being influenced by other people, but you can be wiser about the people you allow to influence you, especially when it comes to the people who influence your faith. It can be easy as we go into school, we hang out with our people, our friends, um, the things that we do outside of school, we think, yes, those are the people that influence us. I want you to think at an even deeper level. What are the people that influence your faith? We come to this place, we have fun, we worship, we have fun times with our small group leaders, 
but how many times do you interact with those individuals outside of church? How many times do you hang out with them? How many times do you talk to your small group leaders? How many times do you talk to Jess or Abby or Unhe or I? Those are, these are some of the people, some examples, and for you, that might be not your thing. It might be like, Unge, Hun, Unhe gives me the like, heebie-jeebies, and I'll be like, yeah, I relate. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So last week, we started talking about a book in the Bible called Hebrews, which, does anybody know if it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament? New Testament. New Testament, Correct. And anybody know, like, what book of the Bible it comes after? The ones before it. it. Okay, we will get to that. (laughs) I don't even know if I should answer. I want you to explore yourself. Um, But Jess introduced us to a long list of people who are known for their faith in God, as well as welcomed some of our own here at Fusion to the front. Um, And they are in our prayers as they're recovering. However, I want to take some time to highlight one of those prominent figures in Hebrews, Uh, who goes by the name of Moses. Anybody know how to spell Moses? Right off, just shout it out. Yes, it's very simple. It is two S's, one M, one O, and an E. Put it all together and you have Moses. He's a pretty cool dude. Pretty cool dude. So I'm going to go to the next slide here. So who is this dude, Moses? We say it a lot in church, and you might have been like, I've grown up here my entire life. I know who Moses is. Well, just to refresh your memory, I'm just going to give a little summary. So before Moses was ever born, God's people were taken into captive and enslaved by the nation of Egypt. Uh, After a bunch of generations in Egypt, the enslaved Israelites had grown to such a large group of people. So imagine fusion times like a couple thousand that Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, feared that they would rebel against him. So imagine like a people that's not your own, living in a place that you call home. This guy was feared. He was, he was scared. He didn't know what was going to happen. To protect his power and to keep the Israelites oppressed, Pharaoh ordered all of the firstborn boys of Israel to be drowned in the Nile River. So this might be a little weird. It might be a little dark. But if you're the firstborn like dude, raise your hand. Okay? So you all would be dead. You would all be killed. You would no longer be here. So ladies, you would, you would run fusion, basically. That's, that's super cool. So you would, yes, you would get to meet God. Um, so, but one of the, those firstborn boys was a baby named Moses. And how do we spell Moses? That was really bad, but we're going to continue. How are we to save Her son Moses, Moses' mother, put Moses in a basket and placed him in the Nile River, trusting God to rescue him. So from the river, Moses was picked up by none other than Pharaoh's own daughter, which she raised him as her own, which you can imagine for her, she did at the time, she was like, baby. (laughs) But to everybody else, this was somebody that shouldn't be alive, which is kind of crazy. But when Moses grew up, he wasn't okay with the way that Pharaoh was enslaving his people. Even though Moses had all the power and resources and privileges that came with being a member of the royal family, he threw it all away to protect an enslaved man who was being beaten by one of Pharaoh's soldiers, by killing the soldier. So imagine that we were saying before, the people that we hang out with are homies. So David, get up here. And yes, you can get up here. So okay, so imagine... You are, David, you are Moses, and you are his friend, okay? So I'm going to need you two to come up here. So you're just going to be a witness, okay? You're going to, like, just, like, fake beat him up. And, yo, this would be upsetting for you, right? You would be like, oh, my gosh. So you defend him, and then he's dead. Now, thank, let's give a round of applause for our helpers. So... Basically, now imagine Moses, which in this scenario was David, him just beelining out of this room. I know, I should have had him run. (laughs) Basically, he fled to avoid being killed, and that's where he met God in a pretty incredible way. So God shows up in a bush. Yes, he shows up in a bush. The bush is flooded. And guess what? The bush was on fire. Mind blown. So he, spoke, he showed up in a bush, 
And this is what he said to Moses. So if you guys have your Bibles, and if it's on your phone, that's cool too. If not, you can look up at the screen, Exodus 3, 10 through 12. So now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I'm the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. So you might think that after God protected Moses as a baby, then later as a young man, as he escaped the evil clutches of the Egyptians, that Moses would be ready to trust God with anything, right? You guys would assume that? Like he survived as a baby. He grew up in a place that wasn't his own. He killed somebody and then was able to run away without being Killed, yes. And then able to take care of the land and was able to survive on what he had. That he would probably be able to trust God after hearing this, correct? No. Would you guys assume? No. no? Man, you guys already know the story. <laughs> but it took Moses a minute to find his faith. Moses struggled with a lot of doubt, thinking he wasn't good enough or talented enough for God to use him. I mean, as we see here, God, like, God literally appeared in front of Moses in a bush and was like, who am, and then God, Moses was like, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of people of Israel out of Egypt? So there was a lot of doubt. But God continued to remind him how much he mattered to him, how much he could be instrumental to the kingdom of God. God even gave Moses some help by sending Moses' brother Aaron along with him. So he's scared out of his mind. He's like, God, how can you use me? And then God's like, yo, I got your brother. He's going to help you out. Which is super sick. I think it's super sick. <laughs> so, in Moses' life, who were the catalysts for his faith? Who were the catalysts in his life? So from that summary, if you were listening, who may be a catalyst? So a catalyst reminder, it's like a jump start. It helps us move along, help us to move and grow. Just shout them out. A bush. A bush. A bush. The daughter, what? Aaron? Anybody else? The guy he killed. The guy he killed. Okay. <laughs> we might we might put a pause on that one. Okay. So his mother was a catalyst by showing Moses what it looked like to trust God, even when things seemed impossible. So for his mother, he's literally she's literally giving up Moses, her her only child, and at the time to have a boy. It was like really it had a lot of weight in the family because that was somebody that would be an heir, that was somebody who would take on the family traditions. The enslaved man Moses protected because he showed that Moses, that he showed Moses that people are worth fighting for. Moses' brother Aaron, by partnering with Moses to help him carry out God's mission, you could say the bush, and some of the other examples that we said. I would also suggest that even Pharaoh and his soldiers were catalysts on Moses' journey by showing him there was evil and injustice in the world. Because imagine, like, Moses, he killed the guy, and if the Egyptians didn't run him out of the place, the chances are he might have not gotten to that bush at the time that he did. So as a result, Moses took God up on the invitation to help rescue Israel from Egypt. Under Moses' leadership, a whole nation of people saw God do something miraculous. To them, Moses became a catalyst for their faith too. So in Hebrews 11, 23 through 29, we'll see on the screens, it was basically, this gives a reflection of what Moses did by faith. Like we said in the end before, the parents were an example. They, gave, they saw that God gave them a special child. In this translation, it says unusual child. So if your parents ever say you're unusual, just take it as a special hint. Um, it was by faith that God... That when Moses, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to share the oppression and move forward. So why does this matter? Those are some pretty nice words to describe Moses and his family and the things that he did for God. But how can Moses' story apply to us? Moses' story of faith wasn't just a catalyst for the faith of the people that he helped rescue from the Egypt. Moses' faith was a catalyst for the earliest followers of Jesus. I mean, this happened in the Old Testament, and now we're reading it in the New Testament. This was an implication for followers of Jesus that they could reflect and see Moses' story of faith and use it to, as a catalyst for their own. 
And then next slide here. Okay. Next one. Next slide. Okay. So next one. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So this is Moses' legacy. He is a catalyst for our faith. Scripture is full of stories like these, but Scripture isn't the only place where we can find catalysts. They're all around us even now. And people in your small group leaders, Jess, Austin, Abby, Unhe, the hospitality team, I mean, there's a reason why we have food and snacks on the table every week. Thank you. Your yes, thank you. It was a round of applause for them because they do a lot. Your friends, your family members, and so much more. The faith of others can be a catalyst on our journey. So you may be thinking, Gavin, like, okay, so we're talking about catalysts. We're talking about this guy named Moses. We're talking about people that we see around us. How can we identify these individuals? Well, think of, let's say you're hanging around an individual for a long period of time. So for example, I was hanging out with Austin. Austin and I hung out, we hang out a lot, actually. Sometimes we find that we text each other a lot more than our girlfriends, and sometimes even more than people here at work. We hang out a lot. Ever since I started hanging out with Austin, over time, I started to listen to the same music that he listened to. I started to read some of the same books that he liked to read. I started to see the same things he liked to see. It was over time hanging out with him that he, like my likes became very similar to his. Those are the people that are catalysts to your faith. Those are the people that you surround yourself with. So if you're thinking, okay, why do I listen to this music? It may be your own taste, but it also may be somebody that's around you. So it's the same thing with our faith. We come to this place, we come and we worship the Lord. The people that we are sitting with right now, how are they impacting our lives? What are they changing? What are the perspectives that we are seeing? Maybe this week, start to listen to what those people are saying. Start to hear and to see what they are doing. Because there might be some things that you're like, okay, I didn't used to have this thing that I had a problem with, but I found out that this person also has this problem, and then just by being associated with that individual, I also started to feel those same things. That's the catalyst that we're kind of looking for. Now, the real question is, in the weeks that we'll get to, identifying who are the good and the bad catalysts, who are the ones that will help us and improve our faith, and who are the ones that kind of bring us down a little bit. So, I'm, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to do a little science experiment. Nothing will, in, it, nothing will explode. I, I promise you that. Huh? Not, you're not okay with it? The food dye? This is, this is actually, this is Jess's food dye, so you have to take it up with her. <laughs> Scaring the young ones. So, catalysts are like this experiment. So, oh, cool. So we walk through life, reading our Bible, going to church, going to school, but then we come across somebody that every time that we're around them, it kind of just feels a little different. At first, it doesn't appear much, but their story alone kind of draws you in. I'm, drink it. <laughs> <laughs> At first, it appears that it hasn't changed you, that there's no real implications to your life. I know this is a lot of food dye. I'm sorry, Jess, for using a lot of your food dye. I will hopefully re reimburse later. <laughs> But at first, it doesn't appear much, but you begin to feel that as you hang out with them, you realize how God is really doing things in your life. That he's doing a lot. Let me get the bubbles out of the way. It is Alka-Seltzer. So you see that there's bubbles starting to be forming. Things are starting to go up to the horizon. As things are going, things are moving, things are going, it's starting to really pick up there, isn't it? This is what it means to be a catalyst. These people around us are starting to hang out with us. They're starting to change the way that we think. But I want to encourage you even further. The biggest catalyst of our lives is Jesus Christ. He is the one that regardless of how many of these Alka-Seltzer plus tablets that we have that are metaphorical for our friends, for our family members, he is the one 
that really pulls it all in together. You begin to feel that he encourages us. He changes our faith. Isn't this pretty cool? Sometimes a person's impact on our faith will be obvious and immediate. Like this experiment, over time, things started to change. But for God, it can almost be instantaneous. Other times it will be more subtle or over a long period of time like Moses. But we're in a community here like Fusion. We're all impacting each other. So this week, I encourage you to find your catalyst. Ask God to reveal who those people are in your life. If you're having a hard time coming up with that list, maybe talk to some of your small group leaders about ways to identify catalysts that they've identified in their lives. Oh, let me get this piece of paper turned. Keep your focus on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 states, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Overall, Jesus is the true catalyst of our faith. If it wasn't for his sacrifice, we would not be unable to grow and to mature in our faith, to be close with the Father. This thing is only temporary. This experiment only lasted a couple of minutes. God's impact on our life lasts a lifetime. So keep going and know that God is with you. Your faith is like a marathon. You're not competing with the people around you. You're not behind. You're not losing. There's no one that you can beat. It's not a competition. It's not a performance. You can go at your own pace and know that God is with you and nothing can stand against you. So as the band comes up to finish the last song, I'm going to give a word of prayer. Father, just bow your heads with me. Father, help us to become more aware of your presence throughout our week. For those of us that have found their catalyst, thank you for being with them. For those of us that are still searching, help guide their hearts. We're thankful for you, Jaira, our great provider. Lord, we're so incredibly thankful that you can give us examples of people in our lives. And Lord, I just ask that if you just put those thoughts in our brains as we were listening to the word this um, evening, that you allow us to kind of hold on to them throughout this week. Give us the hindsight and um, the ability and the discernment to be able to look amongst our friends and our family members um, and those that are around us that we haven't really gotten to know yet. Help us to come to know them and to become close to them and to be able to identify how their impact in our lives, where it's changing.